Hey guys, Denise here. Today I want to show you a video of Diane Bruni, who's talking about a very serious injury that she sustained uh, while she was teaching yoga. I, I think she taught yoga for many, many years up until the time that she passed away, which was just a few years ago. She was a, a master um, Ashtanga teacher. She had her own studio, which was very successful. And yeah, she was somebody who was very, very dedicated to her practice, very good at the primary series and spent hours and hours and hours in the practice. She was totally devoted. She herself would probably say that she was somewhat addicted to the practice. And she talks about that in this video that I'm going to share with you. But I just want to make some comments about it because it really highlights some of the myths that have been ongoing and just don't seem to want to go away in the yoga world. People are practicing this, um, you know, teachers are using this kind of thinking to practice themselves and then passing it along to their students, which I think, you know, is, is kind of a dangerous situation, especially in light of the fact that we have better information now. And we know from decades of practice what can happen to our joints, et cetera. So let's just have a look at um, Diane's story and I'll make some comments about it. So here we go the series, the primary series, every day, religiously. It was my religion. I was very, very attached to it. I would say that I was addicted to it. I had to practice. If I did not practice for at least two hours, I was happier if I had three, six days a week. I, I believed that I wouldn't feel as good as I felt. So I, I had to keep practicing because I thought I'd fall apart without it. And, you know, the fact is many people kind of feel like yoga pulls them apart but it gives them such a feeling of looseness in their joints that they really enjoy that feeling. And they think that the worst thing that ever could happen to them is that they would tighten up. <laughs> and so they wanna maintain that loose feeling in their joints. But you know, where does that lead? Well, let's listen to a little bit more. With that level of practice, and that's all I did, right? So I wasn't going to the gym or doing other forms of fitness at that point. At that time, I was just doing primary series. Well, what happened to me is typically what happens to most people who do just that for a very long time. One of the first things that goes is the knees with that particular practice. So my knees started to hurt. I ignored it. Ashanga teachers around me were telling me that you have to break your knees to be able to get into those poses. Those words were used. <laughs> Which is just amazing to me. Can you imagine telling your students that they have to break their knees for the sake of the practice? I can see some teachers being so kind of blindly devoted to the practice that they would go along with that because yoga and the practice has such a central point in their life. There is, is kind of a religious devotion to it. But for us to have that attitude and then teach postures in such a way that that is a potential for our students seems very unethical to me. And the fact that we would not question that is very concerning. But um, of course, Diane did learn her lesson. By the most fanatic teachers from New York, who I had up here, when I told them I was starting to have knee problems, they said, oh, that's normal. Oh, okay, so I shouldn't worry. No, don't worry about it. That's part of the change that has to take place. Your knees are changing. You have to go through this in order to be able to do those postures. And, you know, this just kind of brings me to that the point about, yeah, sometimes we have to do hard things in order to grow. But this is a case where that is misapplied. You know, you don't have to break your knees to be good at yoga. You don't have to break your knees to reach some kind of spiritual enlightenment or any part of your body. If you are experiencing something like that, then there's something wrong with the way that you're practicing. You know, I don't like to throw out the practice because I know that you can practice in such a way that you strengthen the body and make it more resilient, but it just depends on the approach. And if your approach, as Diane's approach was, like extreme end range poses, holding them for a long time, and basically going for the stretch and going deeper and deeper into end range positions, then, you know, this is where it leads. I believe them. I wanted to believe them. After about a year and a half of pain, like it grew and grew, it started waking me up in the middle of the night, aching, deep pain. I thought, okay, time to go to the doctor. The doctor did an ultrasound. This test showed I had a cyst inside my knee from friction. She said, probably the yoga. Why don't you just stop doing those, those postures? I said, good. You know, I would say probably not really from friction. 
but probably from compression, right? Because the joint gets squeezed when you are in deep postures, like if the knee is extremely bent or like in, um, you know, the lotus poses, especially if that doesn't feel natural in your body and you're really working at it, then you're going to compress and rotate the knee to get into that position. And, you know, that is where the issue happens. You know, your joints actually don't mind like some compress, release, compress, release, or even a little bit of shearing as long as it's not too much. But to be kind of screwed down or screwed into each other, one bone kind of getting screwed into the other, it doesn't like that. It does not respond well to that, especially when it's repeated over and over and over again over time. Good idea. Okay. <laughs> Great. My livelihood depended on it. My studio was based on it. Every single class I taught was, was that. And that was huge jolt. It was like, poof, poof, jolt. Like I couldn't, I couldn't sit like this. I could only go this far for about a year and a half after I would stop doing the poses. Eventually it's all better now. But um, I began to ask people what I should. Well, let's, before we get into what, what she asked people, because this is quite funny, but I just want to say, you know, like, Injury, you can heal from your injuries. And this is a very common story with certain types of ways of practicing. And many, many yoga teachers have disclosed this kind of story to me, um, especially, you know, with the practices that use the same postures, you know, in sequence over and over again, because they're, they're not getting enough variety in the stimulus and the stimulus is a little bit too aggressive. So, you know, it, it just amounts to a really bad situation. And as you saw, like her, her practice depended on that. She was a teacher. She needed to keep teaching. She had a studio. She needed to keep that open. So that meant that she, it, she was in a position where she felt like she had to keep teaching these poor mechanic, more, poor mechanical practices just because that's who she was and what she was doing. And I really feel like this is a very distressing place for a yoga teacher to be in when she's teaching, she knows something that she knows isn't quite right because it's hurting her own body. Many teachers have this experience and they go on to have, you know, reconstruction surgery in their hips or even a hip replacement or something like that. There's been many, many teachers. You are probably also aware of Jill Miller and um, Kino McGregor had reconstructive surgery. So these are master teachers. I mean, they know the practice. They, it seems like they know what they're doing, but they are doing things that are really harming their joints over time. And, you know, if the teacher isn't aware of that until 10 or 20 years later, what's happening to our students? You know, because they're totally blind to it and they're trusting us to give them the kind of information they need to take care of themselves. And that's just not happening. To do. Like all the teachers who were older than me at the time, what should I do? Does this happen to you? What have you heard? And the general consensus was that I should be doing hip openers. So I did. That's what they tell you. When your knees hurt, it's because your hips are too tight. And I just love this kind of storytelling that goes on in yoga. Oh, well, this is happening because of that. You know, it's, it's way too simplistic. Maybe it sounds kind of logical, but you know, it, it, it just indicates a complete lack of awareness, a complete lack of education and a complete lack of understanding how the body even operates. So, you know, again, I've, I've made other videos on hip openers, but, you know, to, to, again, think that, well, to make your broken knees feel better, you need to now break your hips is, it just sounds like a really bad plan, which, which you will see it was. We got to do more hip openers. Okay. Made sense. So pigeon, box pigeon, legs behind the head, like Baddha Konasana, Padmasana, all of those poses, long holds, really working on the hip openers. And the knee pain all went away. I want to just say something about the long holds because <clears throat> she's not talking about active poses here, right? These hip openers are passive poses and they are often highly leveraged poses, which means you're using one bone or body part to really compress another body part, like in pigeon when it's done passively, like in box or in full lotus. You can really kind of wind up your joints in those positions and use leverage from other bones and joints or your own body weight to push that joint further. And then you just sit there. So uh, a lot of yin posture, 
postures are like this too. So this is the kind of stimulus that led up to what you're going to hear about happening to her. So that was wonderful. And my hips became very, very flexible and very, very open. And one day I was sitting at Downward Dog up on the stairs where I used to have the singing bowls and I was playing this. Downward Dog is her yoga studio, <laughs> not, not the position she was in. So she was sitting playing her um, singing bowls. Singing bowls. It was a Sunday morning. I went in early to play the bowls and meditate before the class came in. And I was sitting like this. I was sitting like this. I was sitting, I was reversing. I sat for about an hour in those two or three positions. And I actually said to myself, wow, your hips are open. It doesn't even hurt because it used to hurt me a lot to sit like this. My knees were up here. My legs would go numb. Like it used to be a big problem. So there I was sitting. Now all the hip openers worked. I could sit for an extended period of time, very still, very comfortable with no feeling of discomfort anywhere. I went to get up. And I stood up, I was, I'll show you, I was doing this. <clears throat> this was now like 10 minutes after sitting. I went to do this and I heard pop, 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 pop in my hip. Tendons tearing off the bone. Have you, I don't know if you've ever heard that popping sound. I've never heard it before, but it was loud and it was brutal. And you will never forget that sound if you ever get to hear it. <laughs> fell to the floor, I was starting a class. I sat like this, I played the ball, <laughs> I counted. I was, I was really into counting those days, just like doing the series, not mixing it up, calling the pose and counting from one to five. I didn't have to demonstrate, nobody knew. At the end of the class, everybody leaves and last person's in the room watching me do this. <laughs> helps me up. I hop in a cab. I go home. I get diagnosed by a sports medicine doctor. And um, the diagnosis was I tore my muscles off the bone. The Torn her tendons, as she said at first, which is, of course, what is attached to the bone. So yeah, definitely tendinous tear, which is not uncommon in yoga. The question he kept asking me was, what were you doing when it happened? And I said, I wasn't. He, he, he thought I was being assisted. He thought I was going into an extreme posture, like he was looking for the reason why that could happen to me. And I said, I was doing like, I didn't even go into the posture. Like that's nothing. I was just moving. And it's like, he, and then he said, what were you doing before it happened? And I realized as soon as he said that, I got it. I had been sitting in postures without moving for an hour. And I just saw. And you know, if you sit in Lotus, half lotus, sukhasana, variations of sitting on the floor postures for an hour, normally that's not going to be a problem, you know, just, just sitting somewhere like that for an hour. It's just all the things like the, the, when she said the doctor asked her like, what were you doing right before? Sure. That's what she was doing the hour before, but the years and perhaps more than a decade before that, you know, she was doing hip openers <laughs> and, you know, an Ashtanga practice that was letting her break her joints. That's what she was doing before this happened. These are gradual onset injuries that take a long time to become acute, which is what happened to her when you pop tendons. Now it's an acute injury. But until then, it's something that's setting in gradually. This is the by far the most typical kind of injury in yoga. It doesn't even have to be this particular site, but it often is. But these are injuries that happen gradually over time. You don't realize they're happening. But remember, she was saying like her knees started bothering her at night. So that's when it's getting pretty bad. It bothers you, feels really bad first thing in the morning until you get your body moving. This is often why people would go and take hot yoga because they don't feel the pain in hot yoga and they can keep aggressively destroying their joints. But, you know, it's that's when you know it's bad is when it's in your conscious awareness a lot outside of the practice, of course, and it's interfering with your daily life, with your sleeping and everything. You really need to pay attention when it gets to that point. I saw him recently, actually, and I told him the story that, you know, I, I tell this story all the time in the teacher training programs I do. I always tell my, my students this story as a lesson on what I did wrong. So the... 
um, the analogy he gave me was if you take a piece of meat and you hang it from a hook, the numbers I'm going to get wrong. Maybe you can, doesn't matter what the numbers are. You hang a piece of meat from a hook after 10 minutes, it's going to hang down another 20%. After another 10 minutes, it's going to hang down another 30%, et cetera, et cetera. Until finally, all it takes is one little boing and it falls. It rips right. And, you know, she's talking about muscle and that's definitely true of muscle. I mean, if you, you know, if you have any awareness or familiarity with actual meat that you say would see at a grocery store or something, you can, you can kind of look at it and realize that it, it can tear, right? I mean, it's not alive. So anything that's alive is much, much more resilient than something that is not alive. However, um, you know, what happened to her, as I've mentioned already, is the tendons tore. And they are a lot tougher <laughs> than the meat, you know, the tendons are much tougher. So you can just imagine like how much time and um, how, how much abuse the tendon can take before it actually lets go. And that's that, you know, that's just exactly what we see when people have these gradual onset injuries and then finally an acute injury. There's been a long time where that tendon's been putting up with abuse and it just gets it, it into a state where it just can't do that anymore. And it lets go. Right off because it's gradually, gradually, gradually becoming weaker and weaker and weaker because of the forces. And this is the thing, it's getting weaker. So like I say, something that's alive is more resilient, but you are making it weak by this constant passive loading. This does not strengthen. I know you're going to hear certain people who are advocates of yin yoga, for instance, talking about how these passive loads actually strengthen tendons. But I'm telling you the the strengthening that would happen is minuscule. And oftentimes what you do is weaken the musculotendon junction or the place where the tendon actually uh, connects to the, the periosteum of the bone. And you're not developing any, you know, proprioceptive sensitivity, you're probably reducing your sensitivity there. You're not developing coordination and control and strength. You're getting, you're making your tissues weaker, especially the muscle tissue, but also the, the connective tissues, as we saw here. Is of gravity and the weight of the meat. So he said, I am. You overstretched your muscles so much that there was nothing holding them on the bone. Wow. What a shock that was for me. That was a shock. The rehab process was incredibly painful because um, I had to process a lot of, um, just I had to question so much. What I, when I started to rehab, I realized that my gluteal muscles were completely dysfunctional, completely dysfunctional. The bad side that I ripped, of course, is dysfunctional. The good side was dysfunctional. I couldn't engage. I was having like this little private thing with a friend of mine who was, just took a Pilates course and she was showing me some glute strengthening exercises and I couldn't do it. I couldn't strengthen, I couldn't engage. Whoa, what the heck? And I realized that I had been training myself to disengage my glutes. Everything I had heard from every single yoga teacher was relax your glutes, soften your glutes, relax your glutes, soften your glutes. Bridge pose, back bends, everything, relax your glutes, relax your glutes. I did. When I started doing Ashtanga, I didn't. I used them. And I was constantly being told to relax them. I bet. This also happened to me when I first started practicing yoga. You know, I was already a group fitness teacher. I was a personal trainer. I was a massage therapist. I was prescribing remedial exercise and developing programs for that. So I, I knew the importance of the glutes. I just, I couldn't believe that uh, I, my trainers were trying to tell me to relax my glutes. It, it was so counterintuitive. And I think a lot of us who come from the movement world, then we know movement science and have you know some depth there, are very confused by that at first. <laughs> there are some kind of rules of asana that don't make any sense at all, and yet they're perpetuated and not questioned. So yeah, you know, hey, if you're like me, I totally understand that confusion, but I'm here to tell you, you know, yoga is not magic. It does play by the rules of the body, and your glutes are very, very important for hip function and pelvic floor function and spine function. So let's make sure that our glutes are nice and strong, okay? Eventually learn to relax them. 
What happens when your glutes become dysfunctional is your hip flexors begin to overwork. And that's a common pattern and something that's happening a lot right now. For a lot of people, it's a big problem. And, um, but it took me years to process this information. How, how often have you seen social media posts or yoga teachers talking about how to stretch out your tight hip flexors? <laughs> So you practice in such a way that your glutes get really weak and that makes your hip flexors try to make up for that weakness and try to keep the pelvis and the femur stable one upon the other. Um, so you're overworking your psoas and maybe your rectus femoris and, and now let's stretch those out and make those dysfunctional too. That I assure you is not the answer. You have to understand I was extremely insecure about it. I was afraid to talk about it. Mm -hmm. When I did finally, after a couple of years, I knew that I was right because I had strengthened my glutes again. I'd done all these rehab exercises, so now they were functional again. And I felt so much better that I realized that, yeah, like, I, I, you know, what I had been doing was completely imbalanced. And every, in, you know, we, we're told to strengthen and engage every single muscle in our body, depending on what pose we're doing. So every single muscle gets this attention and this intention to like activate, energize, engage. And all the glutes ever heard was to soften. I realized it was completely wrong and didn't make any sense. And I've talked to umpteen physiotherapists, chiropractors, doctors, people who have been injured, have gone to their chiropractors, doctors, physios. Everyone comes back to me and reports to me because in the first few years they thought I was crazy. So maybe that's enough to um, of this video to watch. Um, I sort of feel like I'm in that position sometimes, like people just think I'm crazy. Like, why do I care? Like how asana is being done? But this is why, you know, this is just one example. I've heard many, you know, I don't have, a, a, you know, unfortunately recording of the many, many stories that um, yoga teachers have told me about their own experiences with breaking their body for the sake of asana. And, you know, like we, we have some very faulty thinking going on in the yoga world and the rest of the movement world has moved on. They know better. Like we know how to make sure our hips are strength, uh, strong and resilient. We know how to protect the knees and we know how to get stronger. And, you know, where you see Diane in her language, she talks about activating every muscle. And now with this new world of fascia research, we have access to I don't talk about individual muscles. I mostly talk about, you know, the fascial lines, the chains of communication between the, the fascia and the muscles that we employ to create dynamic stability in the body, which is just a, a much more efficient and elegant way of talking about what it is that we're doing in our body. Like, what are we trying to do anyways? I think what we're really trying to do is create a container to build our prana. If, you know, there's no point in building prana through meditation and pranayama and the other techniques of yoga, if you haven't strengthened your physical vessel to handle more prana. So, you know, that's what the asana is about. It's about creating a stronger, more resilient body. And this allows you to live your life's purpose. And, you know, like when you have serious injuries like this, it's very disconcerting. And, you know, Diane was talking about how she had a lot of unpacking to do. And what she meant by that was she had to re-examine things that she believed for a really long time and realized that she'd been wrong about that. And that's, that's a tough place for a yoga teacher to come to. But somehow that we have developed this disconnect, we have all of this kind of old myths around like relax your glutes and be in passive postures for a long time, open your hips, break your knees. But we're not, we're not thinking about like, well, why is that supposed to be good for us? You know, like why is, why is that supposed to get us to that place where we have a strong, resilient body that can literally hold a charge, hold the prana that we want to build within it and, uh, you know, actually act on our life's purpose. You know, it just makes no sense. So it's time. I think it's a time for a new dawn in yoga. And that's what I'm all about in my Activated Asana Apprenticeship Academy. I hope you'll check it out. But let's not have disasters like this happen anymore in the yoga world. Let's build the body that we need to make a better world. How about we do that?